quote, in a way, is anybody interested in reading The Forgotten Trinity by James White? Please raise your hand if you're interested. Got to see three hands. Okay. Four hands. All right, so raise your hands where I can see them if you don't care. Who would be willing to read this within four weeks? Okay, I see some hands like that. So who would be willing to read this in three weeks? Raise your hand where I can see them. One, two. Okay, put your hand down real quick. Um, would you be willing to read this in three weeks and then talk to me after you're done reading it? Please raise your hand. Alright, I'm going to give it to Tori Nichols. Can't wait to talk to you about this book. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your redemption in your son Jesus, Lord. Uh, we live and move and have our being by your grace. So let's pray that you give us ears to hear and understand the word this morning and we begin to go to the state of the faith. More importantly, what the state of the faith says about your word. I just pray that we be uh, in tune to the spirit and to your word. So we're going to cover a lot of ground this morning. We're going to be talking about the Trinity, and we're going to be talking about God and the Father. So if you're like me, I grew up in a church home, and I took a lot of things for granted. Like I just was told that we believe the Trinity, and I, I was just like, okay, I believe that, but I didn't really know where in the Bible it tells us that you know the Trinity is a actual doctrine. So it wasn't until I got older and I started sharing my faith and sharing the gospel with people, and then I met a Jehovah's Witness. And that Jehovah's Witness, he said, where is the word Trinity even at the Bible? And I remember he was this right here. I don't know. You know? And uh, he started asking a ton of questions, trying, and I just found myself unequipped to be able to explain the doctrine of Trinity. This is the God we worship. Right? So, I really want to better group us this morning with a better understanding of who God is and what God is. We're going to be talking about the differences between the what of God and the who of God. So, for all you note takers, I want to talk about three foundational truths. You're going to see that we're going to go through all of these as we go through our statement of faith. Number one is we believe that the Bible teaches that there is one true God. This is called monotheism. Uh, second major foundation is we believe in three divine persons. And number three, we believe in the equality of those persons. So if we deny one of these three categories, we actually commit a huge heresy. A heresy being a false teaching that really um, separates us from God and truth. Mormonism teaches that many people, uh, they believe in many gods, and you can become a god one day. So they ultimately deny the fact that there is one God. Oneness of Pentecostalism teaches that God shifts between different modes or he puts on different masks to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit when it's a convenient time. And so this view denies the three persons and sees no distinction between the members of the Trinity. And like I said, Jehovah's Witness, they teach that the Father Jehovah first created Jesus the Son. This was this is a major heresy that, that, that denies the deity of of Jesus and totally um, messes up the equality of the persons of God. So, like uh, Pastor Stephen talked about last week, our sole authority must be divided. We must go to Scripture alone. Now, in order to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity, we must go to Scripture alone and all of Scripture. We must do the hard job of interpreting Scripture with Scripture. The totality of Scripture will yield that God is one in His being. And he has also existed in three persons. I believe this is the command that Paul gives all Christians in 2 Timothy 2 15. He says, Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who needs not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of the truth. So, with that being said, please look at your statement of faith, where the first passage says, We believe and teach that there is one God, infinite and self existent who exists eternally as three distinct yet inseparable persons, known as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one in their unchangeable nature, essence, and attributes. So back up and look at that first phrase. 
We, we believe and teach that there is one God, infinite and self-existent. So this is where the Bible teaches us that there is one God. Monotheism, one. Mono meaning one and theism being God. Uh, look at your first scripture reference. I believe it's Deuteronomy uh, 6 verse 4. Where we read this. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. This is known as the Shema. This is where the, the Jews would repeat this every morning. Right? This was important to Jesus. If you look down in Mark uh, chapter 12, on your references there, Jesus repeats the Shema. Right? And then Paul in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, a little bit further down your page, he says, Therefore, as to the eating of the foods offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. So this is the Bible telling us that there is only one God. Now, the, what's really interesting about the time when Moses wrote the five books, the Torah, this, you know, he's saying that there is one God, right? And all the surrounding pagan nations, they believe in many gods. This is a heresy called polytheism. So the Bible is very unique, standing against these other false religions. So since God is infinite and self-existent, he has certain attributes that belong to him and him alone. We're people, right? We have knowledge, right? But God has infinite knowledge. We have a degree of power, but God is all power, right? So he's infinite self existent. So uh, God is all powerful. He is omnipotent. We learn this from the beginning of the Bible, right? In Genesis 1, remember, God is speaking the world into existence, right? That's only possible uh, from an almighty, all powerful being. And I think about the story of Job. A lot of you know that Reagan Job a lot, like, it's just an awesome book for so many applications. But Job lost everything, right? And a lot of us really, you know, empathize with Job and be like, man, that would be so tough. But over the course of time, Job begins to start questioning the purposes of God, right? And Job chapter 38, God says to Job, he gets tired of it because Job almost starts getting sassy with God. And so Job said, or God says to Job, where were you? When I laid the foundation of the earth, tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who has stretched the line upon it? God is asking Job, okay, if you're all powerful, if you're perfect, you tell me what's going on. Job figured out pretty quick he's speaking to the, the Creator, the Almighty, the powerful Creator, right? And so Job finally responded later in chapter 42. He says, I know that you are God and can do all things. And that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So God is all powerful. He's omnipotent. God is also all knowing. He's omniscient. And this is really the foundation of prophecy. When you look into the Old Testament, we read about a lot of prophets are foretelling things that are going to happen with the Messiah, right? And the only way that that's possible is for God to know everything and choose to reveal some things to prophets. Right? So I want to get in y'all's mind to think about we serve one God, the Bible teaches that, and he has certain attributes that belong to him alone. He's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, and his, his presence is everywhere. He's omnipresent. But I don't want you to think that God is in everything. Right? For a lot of people, um, the spell is called pantheism. God is a rock, God is a tree, we're all gods. The Bible teaches a clear distinction between the creator and the creation. When we say that God is omnipresent, we're simply saying he sees everything, right? Nothing escapes his sight. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4 says, No creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account. So these are attributes that belong to the one true self-existing God. So let's look at the next phrase in our um, statement of faith. We're talking about God who exists eternally, as three distinct yet inseparable persons, known as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These three are one in their unchangeable nature, essence, and attributes. So if you can, I'd like for you to maybe underline two key words that we're going to spend some time just kind of unpacking here because it can get confusing real fast. So we talk about inseparable persons. On my sheet, I had that underline. That is key. And then if you look down the next line, these three are one in their unchangeable nature. So we're going to talk about the, the difference between persons and nature. Earlier I was saying, God is one what? And three who? 
Okay? I want to create two different categories so we don't get confused saying, well, we believe in one God, but it kind of seems like we believe in three gods. That's not actually what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that there is one God who exists in three persons. So when we say the nature of something, we're talking about its essence or its being. Okay? Um, I like the word being, but it's interchangeable with nature or essence, but I like the word being. But we got to keep in mind that being and person are different. Anything that exists has being, okay? But not everything that exists has personality or has personhood, right? So I was trying to think of an example to maybe illustrate this. If I were to have a rock, right? This rock has rock being. If I were to throw this rock at Craig Nichols and he didn't duck, you figure out very fast that that rock exists because it would clash with his being, right? So if rock has this being, this chairs have cool. being, this microphone yeah. has being, what all these what do you want to do? Lack, 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 lack of personality, just, right? They lack of spirit that allows you to have relationships you. with other persons, right? So this is where, when I'm thinking about human beings, I exist, I'm standing up here right here in front of you, but my being is also shared with one person. Right? So y'all see that the train of thought is on a rock? It's impersonal, but it exists. It has been. I'm a human being, I'm personal, but I am limited and finite. I cannot transcend out of the space and time that I exist right here. Right? There are only human beings that one person. But now, when we talk about God, God is eternal. He is limitless, right? He's almighty, all powerful. So his being is shared with three persons. Now, that doesn't only explain everything to the Trinity, but I think that helps us have a better understanding that being a person is not the same thing. We can even understand that in our everyday experience. Not all beings are personal, right? But God is not bound by space and time. Therefore, His being is shared by the Trinity. That's a novel thing to say. So it might be helpful to kind of define the word Trinity. We're talking about tri, which is three, and unity. But those aren't the same thing. God is three in person, one in being. So on your verses, look at Matthew 28, 19. This is a very familiar verse, but what's hidden in there is a clear teaching of the Trinity. Or we read, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name. I'm trying to emphasize the name there. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you notice it's named singular, it's not names plural, right? This is because it's referring to the singular triune name of God. The only God that is revealed in three persons. So let's look at the next passage of our statement of faith. We believe and teach that each member of the Godhead has a distinct function and the eternal purpose of the Godhead while at the same time possessing full deity. So this is once again where when we when we try to articulate what we believe about God, we have to have an authority. The Bible's already told us that there's one true God, monotheism, right? But then what if we're faced with passages that say the Father is God? The Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God. We believe that, right? And so I was thinking, most people do not dispute that the Father is God. Most false religions, they all agree that the Father out there is definitely God. Usually the point of dispute is saying, well, we don't think Jesus is actually God. Or the Holy Spirit is impersonal. And he's not actually God. So most people don't dispute that the Father is God. But I believe the first time where Jesus speaks to the Father as being God is in John 6. Where Jesus says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. So this is the scripture telling us the Father is God. And also, there are so many scriptures that, that uh, tell us about the deity of Christ, and I believe Titus Drum will really take time to unpack that next week. But uh, the Apostle Paul says this about Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 9. He says, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God forever. Amen. And if you look at the sheet, you can see John 1 1. This might be one of the most clearest passages that tells that Jesus is God. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, a lot of us are familiar with that last phrase, yes. the Word was God. We understand the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and then John chapter 1 continues to tell us that this is Jesus Christ. So we go to John 1 1 to prove the deity of Christ pretty easily. But it's that middle phrase that I want you to look at with, with me real quick. It says, the Word was with God. Right? Only a Trinitarian understanding can make sense of what that's being talked about. Because this is talking about the Word, Jesus being in eternal relationship with God. <laughs> that being said, the Father is God, Jesus is God, and probably the, the best passage to show that the Holy Spirit is God is in Acts chapter 5. And this is where Peter rebukes two people named Ananias and Sapphira. Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie against the Holy Spirit? And he paused, you can't lie to a rock, right? The person, it's kind of foolish to say I lied to that rock, right? You lie to the person. So Peter says, why have you filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Why is it that you contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Right? So this is this is testimony to God's word that is affirming one God, yet the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And they all operate within um, having a personality, or able to have a relationship with one another and with people. And so their roles are distinct from one another. They're not all doing the same thing. And so what we're the Trinity, we're not saying the Father is the Son. We're not saying the Son is the Holy Spirit. We're not saying the Holy Spirit is the Father. Right? And I think one of the best places in the Bible to illustrate how they're all distinct in their roles and function is at the baptism of Jesus. Okay? So who was, who was baptized in Jesus? John the Baptist, right? So Jesus is there, and then who descended on Jesus like a dove? The Holy Spirit. And then a booming voice from heaven said, This is my Son. Whom I am well pleased. So you have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all being present, yet being distinct from one another. And so this is where people get into trouble oftentimes. Because then they say, well, the Trinity is like, and then they give an analogy. Right? Now, I understand that all analogies break down at some point, right? Usually, an analogy is supposed to just illustrate one truth. But the problem is, is the Trinity is a transcendent, eternal reality. The Trinity existed before creation. So when we reach into the creation, and we try to think of something man-made to illustrate something that is eternally true, it breaks down in a major way and actually illustrates some type of the Trinity. Right? Does that kind of make sense? Why? All analogies really don't come close to the Trinity. Have you ever heard that the Trinity is like water? Yeah. I've heard that before. That's right. So I've heard the water can change into a liquid or a gas or a solid. Right? That's usually how I've heard that analogy. And the problem is that God does not change into three different modes. Right? This is called modalism. And so God is one, and yet he exists in three persons. Right? Remember the baptism of Jesus kind of illustrates that. So, there's another analogy that I was taught growing up. Maybe, maybe this will resonate. But the Trinity is like a man who is a father, a son, and a brother to somebody else. But the problem is, it's using a man as who is one of the being and one person. So, this is a heresy called Unitarian. This is what Islam teaches, and this is what Orthodox Jews today teach. Christianity alone affirms that God exists. Right? We go to the Bible and we have all the Bible. Okay. That's we go to one God and we get to the next week. And each of those persons fully share in the nature of God. So, um, I have some this bad analogies, but have you ever heard of that test that I've overdone? Because I don't have to show up on that. So I've, I've heard this, and the big problem is when you use anything in the created order, like a clover, like a really clover or an apple, or an egg, you start dividing up God into perfect. Right? And this may be a small question. Right? So you see the problem is trying to use an analogy to describe the Trinity. And I think a good way to understand the Trinity is understanding the distinction between the being and the person. Right? And then we got to stop somewhere around there because we're not God. We're not going to fully understand. But we're going to have to 
major and logical contradiction. So that being said, there's only one concept that can describe God, and it's God Himself. And it reminded me of the time where God was talking to Moses in the burning bush. What did He say? He said, I am who I am. This means that the Lord is not defined or determined by any other than Himself. God is the eternal existing one. So are we tracking? Tracking? Let's move on to the next statement um, in our statement. Okay. We've got to kind of speed through this um, because I would like to have QA at the end. So hopefully you're making notes, maybe along the way, make some questions. I'd like to maybe leave 10 minutes at the end to hear some questions from y'all. So the, the next phrase says, each is equally worthy of worship and obedience, and each is glorified by the word of redemption. And if, if I've lost you at some point this morning, it's okay. We're talking about the Trinity, right? This is, I mean, this has been heavily disputed and debated, and all I want you to know is go to your Bible. Just let the Bible speak. If you've not heard anything, I want you to know this one crucial truth, that the gospel and salvation is a Trinitarian work. Okay? I want to show you that. Um, look at that passage on page 2. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. We're going to kind of just skim through this. I want to highlight a few things along the way. The beginning of verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about God the Father here. And then verse 4 says, Even as He chose us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Let me pause. This is the gospel finding its origin with God the Father before creation ever existed. Okay? So the gospel, salvation, has its starting point with God the Father. God the Father decreed and chose before the world began a people for salvation. And another way of looking at that is He chose a bride for the Son. Okay? So, if you look down a little bit there in the passage of Scripture, look where it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, our sins and our trespasses. We have forgiveness. So, we have the gospel, you know, having its origin with God the Father. The gospel is accomplished by Jesus Christ, by dying on the cross, paying the full punishment of sin for all those that would repent and believe in God. So this means what the will of the Father before eternity began. This means that Jesus is the perfect Savior. He saves to the uttermost, right? So I want you to see a lock and step unity within the Trinity for accomplishing salvation and establishing the gospel. In fact, John chapter 6, Jesus teaches us that all the Father gives to me will come to me. Then he says that I should lose nothing that the Father has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Gospel has its origin in the Father. It's accomplished by the Son. Now look down um, around verse 13. I know you're, you don't have the references, but we read, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the Spirit, or the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we were acquired possession of it to the praise of His glory. So the gospel is applied by the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit regenerates hearts, right? He indwells believers, and He secures believers unto the day of redemption. So if you get nothing else, the gospel is a Trinitarian work. So, with only a few more minutes, I want us to briefly look at God the Father in section 3. Where we read, We believe and teach that God the Father is the first person in the Trinity. He is infinite self-existent spirit, perfect in holiness, wisdom, power, and love. He is creator of all things and the only absolute omnipotent ruler in the universe. He is sovereign in creation, providence, and redemption. So hopefully a few of those words sound clear because these are attributes that belong to God alone and are also fully shared with the other two members of the Trinity. But I want to emphasize one word here, and it's the word sovereign in that last line. He is sovereign in creation, providence, and redemption. So what does sovereign mean? Simply that God is in control of all things. That means he has a purpose in all things. 
And that means in all things, he gets glory, ultimately. Right? So look on your paper, look at Romans 11.36 on page 3, which says, For from him and through him and to him are all things to whom be the glory forever. Amen. So when you think of sovereignty, just think that God gets glory in everything. He has a purpose. There's nothing meaningless happening in his world. Right? The way that he sees the world, I often think about I have an issue book. I can just flip through the pages of this issue book, and I can see the beginning, and I can see the end. That's how God sees it all the time. In the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? So he sees it all the time right there in front of him. He spoke it all in the so He's sovereign. He had a purpose for everything. The next passage says, We believe and teach that God's fatherhood involves both a destination within the Trinity and his relationship with mankind. He is the creator of all people, but he is the spiritual father only to those who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. He saves from sin all who come to him through Christ alone, securing their adoption as children, as his children, and making them fellow heirs with Christ. So, I don't know if you're familiar with this cliche saying that I hear all the time out in the world, but I've heard people say, aren't we just all God's children? And they're just kind of saying that just generically. There's no distinction between believers and unbelievers, but we're just all God's children. And it kind of breaks my heart because the Bible is so precise that it's only the children of God are those who are in Christ Jesus. They're believers. And so if you would, that kind of towards the bottom of page 3. Look at John uh, chapter 1, verse 2 there, where we read, But to all who did receive him, Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So we're faced with the reality that not everyone is God's children. Only those who have turned to Christ and put their faith solely in him. And that means we are adopted, right? We are adopted as children. So if we're adopted, that means we were previously a part of a different family, right? Y'all see where I'm going with this? The Bible actually teaches us that before, if we're not in Christ, then we're actually children of the devil. First John chapter 3 says, By this it is evident to who, the children, who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love. So let's finally look at the last passage here in section 3, where we read, We believe and teach that God has decreed for his own glory all things that come to pass, knowing instantly all things from beginning to end. He continually upholds, directs, and governs all creatures and events, and in his sovereignty, he is neither the author nor approver of sin, but perfectly judges each person according to his or her own work, thus making people responsible for their own sins. I personally waited to the end to not totally explain all this because uh, I'm a simple man. I'm wearing Mario socks up here, right? So uh, it's, it's easy to ask me really tough questions, and you know what? It's okay. We can search these things out together. Um, I love y'all. I love fellowshipping with the saints, and I love God's Word. I'm convinced this is how we have a relationship with God. We pray to God. That's how we speak to God, and He speaks back to us through His living and breathing. Word. So in this final passage of the statement of faith, I simply want to emphasize that all things work to the glory of God. And I don't understand exactly how all that works. I love reading church history. I love reading theologians that have spent time in God's Word and trying to better understand. Guys, that's going to be a lifelong process. Right. But don't, don't think, well, I can't understand it and I should be pursuing it. Study it. That's a hard question. But I'll be the first to say, I don't know. Well, let's go look at Let's see what we can study and search in God's Word together. I just want to emphasize maybe two more verses in your second page. So I think it's on the last page. So look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Do y'all see that? Alright, on page 12. So this verse, I didn't know this verse was in the Bible. I mean, so I really studied it carefully and slowly and was like, whoa, God is sovereign. God is so much mightier than people. 
We read, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him on the cross. A lot of people get bent out of shape of predestination. I'm like, no, look at the rest of this verse. And this really should surprise you. The purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. I don't know how God does that. But God works all things after the counsel of his will. I just, I'm totally amazed at that truth, right? I don't really, I don't question it because it's in the Bible. People want to dispute, and I'm like, God, we should love each other. When we find hard verses like that, we just, I believe it, I just may not understand. Right? So lastly, let's look at Isaiah 46. It should be the last passage of all those scriptures. This one is just to me like um, Ephesians 1 verse 11. It says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. So I'll pause right there. That's monotheism. There's only one God and there's no other like him. But then verse 10 says, Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, now accomplish all my purpose. Guys, the best way I can think to understand this is I look at a history book. I can go back and forth through it. That's how God deals with time. He spoke it all into existence at creation, at the very beginning. So, how God relates to time is different than how we relate to it. He knows everything. But let's not get mad at God for knowing everything and have, having a purpose in everything. I prefer to let God be God. Since he is sovereign, I can truly rest in the promise of Romans 8, 28. Many of us are familiar with this verse that says that for those who love God, those who are Christians, those who have experienced forgiveness of their sin, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. As God's purpose and everything, if we are saved, we've experienced the mercy and grace of God, right? So then we can say, okay, everything that's happening in my life is for my sanctification. It has a purpose. It's making me more and more like Jesus Christ, right? Everything is working in my life for my sanctification. If I'm in Christ, and then everything is ultimately working for the glory of God. So that's all I have. I feel like I maybe sped really fast through that, but I wanted to leave maybe about 10 minutes or so um, for questions. And I'll probably tell you I don't know the answer, but we'll give it a shot anyway. So if you would raise your hand if you have any questions about the Trinity, or if you have any questions about God the Father and His sovereignty. Uh, I know this can be kind of weird to so many people, but guys, I'm up here standing on stage talking. This is kind of weird for me. Does anybody have any questions? And if not, um, guess what? I have prescriptive questions that I can ask, and we can go through so we got about two minutes. We're all good. We all fully understand the Trinity and the sovereignty of God. <laughs> all right, Nathan. All right. How do we communicate with someone that says, I <laughs> So, what I would try really hard is to say, we are not saying we believe in one God. But then we kind of believe in three things. I think if we present the Trinity like that, then these false religions, cults, they have a basis to say that doesn't make any sense. In fact, it contradicts itself. Rather, we need to affirm what the Bible says that there is one God, and yet he exists in three persons. Remember, we talked about the rock not being personal. I think we can demonstrate how there are things that exist that do not have a personality, right? So I would say we can show how um, things that exist are personal, but then people, human beings, are personal, but there's a huge difference between us and God. So that helps me get a step closer to understanding how God can be revealed in three persons because he's limitless. We are we are limited by space and time, therefore our person can only be shared by one person. So I just want to demonstrate that, and they still say, oh, I think that's just a hill of beans or whatever I say. I'm bound to the Word of God. Being, this is the thing. We can all have good ideas and opinions about stuff, but we need an objective standard to tell us what is actually true. Because if me, if you listen to me and Nathan, we could probably come up with just crazy ideas. Which one is actually true? 
We have to be able to test it against an objective standard to be like, well, Nathan was right and Jeremiah got it way wrong. Right? That's how we get out of, outside of our opinions. We can stand on the uh, Did I answer that or did I do like the politicians do and dance around it and get another answer? Anybody else have any questions? Probably. I'm, I'm actually kind of glad that no one has just any like deep theological filibusters on my fence. I have no idea. So we got a few more minutes. Um, so I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, what, what do we do when someone says, well, where's the Trinity in the Bible? Uh, does anybody want to take a stab how they would answer that question? Trinity is, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Does that mean it's not true? <laughs> well, I, that is that is an interesting concept. I'll definitely say that. Um, but what I what I want to kind of say is, just because a word is not in the Bible, does not mean the Bible. We believe in the Bible, right? Yeah, the word Bible is not in the Bible, right? Yeah, I think on that for a second. But what does the Trinity teach? Teaches that there's one God and that He exists as the first person. The Bible teaches that. So when the Old Witness says, Well, tell me what the trend is, say, great, I can't wait to show you all these scriptures that show that there is one God and that the who of God is the right? So I have another question. Um, I have actually said it, so I'm going to have it. So how can Jesus be God if he's praying to God, right? Now, uh, Travis is going to talk about how more of the deity of Christ. What we have to understand is that John 1, 1 says the word was God in eternity past, right? So Jesus was in glory with the Father, right? But what did Jesus do? He took on flesh and became a man, humbled himself, right? So as he was living in his earthly ministry, Prayed in relationship to the Father. The Trinity is the only thing that can understand what's going on in relationship, right? But the Father was greater than Jesus in terms of God being in glory, and Jesus took, he added on flesh, he took on humanity. So in that relationship, Jesus prayed to the Father and said, The Father is greater than I. Doesn't mean that Jesus is not God, it just shows the unique role that Jesus took on in becoming. Yeah, I love it because God is just not so far and distant away from us, right, that we can't know him. He actually became a man and dwelt among us. So God came to us and he is relational and cares for us and loves us, right? So I think that's the beauty of the Trinity, is you see a working relationship within God. And we get glimpses of the Trinity even in the Old Testament. I don't think the Trinity was explicitly taught in the Old Testament like it is in the New Testament. When you see clues of the Trinity in the Old Testament, like, and I think it's um, it's in Genesis 1, where God created man, and he said, let us make man in our image. Right? So even from the beginning, there was a plurality to God. He's one in his being, but he had relationship within himself. And so I think you get clues in the Old Testament, and then we read in the New Testament, we see the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? I think of the apostles being experientially Trinitarians, right? Because Peter, very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, believed in God the Father, so to speak. But then he met Christ. He understood that he was God. And then, I think of Pentecost, he got the Holy Spirit, right? So he was a, uh, he experienced the Trinity like all of us do who are in Christ. So, <clears throat> we got maybe one more minute or two. Does anybody have any? Questions or Did it make sense a little bit? I hope to have equipped y'all a little bit with, I think the best way to approach the Trinity is understanding a distinction between being and person. Right? And then like I said, one of the takeaways is that the gospel, salvation is a Trinitarian work. So. Alright, going once? Going twice? Alright, let's pray. Holy Father, thank you so much for the word. God, thank you for challenging us, God. We are 
brothers and sisters. God, and if we have to bend the knee and trust that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, your ways are higher than our ways. So God, I pray that we would uh, not lean on our own understanding when we approach your word, but we would take any tradition or presuppositions that we have, God, as we approach your holy scripture. We would allow you to speak truth into us. Lord, we love you. Praise God.